Well, let's go ahead and jump into this. A biblical study on sheep and shepherds. We've been in this since August. Wow. Wow. (laughs) Let's put up here for review what we've covered. Lesson one, we talked about the people of his pasture. Lesson two, we, we finished that off last week. We talked about leading sheep. Tonight, we're just gonna go straight for the jugular. Let's look at this in lesson three. Let's talk about the life of a goat. We're just gonna go, we're just gonna just we're just gonna rip the band-aid off tonight, amen. We're gonna talk about goat behavior. Now, some of you in here might be saying, Pastor, we're the Wednesday crowd. We're the sheep, right? <laughs> What are you even talking about? The life of a goat. Well, there's a number of different reasons why we need to understand the life of a goat. One, we need to understand, and Jesus said this, sheep and goats are going to mingle together in church. That's just the way it is. If you think that a church is going to be full of all sheep and no goats, you're fooling yourself. Uh, Jesus said that the wheat and the tares are going to grow together. One of the things I've learned over the last few years as a pastor is I pastor wheat and I also pastor tares. I pastor sheep and I also pastor goats. Now, some of you might say, yeah, but man, didn't, and I'm going to talk about this, didn't Jesus say in Matthew 25 that the sheep are going to be divided on the right and the goats are going to be divided on the left? Well, why are you talking about God? I'm going to tell you why. Because sometimes good sheep turn into goats. What do I mean by that? Good Christians that love the Lord, faithful to church, submissive to God, following the direction of the shepherd, Jesus, obviously, first and foremost, and then the local vision of the church. Sometimes people start to display goatish behavior. And what I mean by that is if you start to notice, and we're, we're, just, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg tonight. If you start to notice some of this goat behavior in your life, you need to get it right. Because all of us, I don't care who you are, all of us at one time or another have started to display goat behavior. And that's when we got to put a stop to it and make sure that we don't turn into a goat. Are y'all here tonight? So you're like, Pastor, this is Christmas week. What are you doing talking about this? This is talking about the life. Well, it's because it's the next lesson in our series. Amen. Let's put this next slide up here. Matthew 25, 31. We're going to read about three, three verses here, I think, three or four. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. Verse 32. And before him shall gather all the nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Verse 33. And he shall set the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Let's put this picture up here. That's church right there. That's church. And after 28 years of being a pastor now, I could vouch that that's church. The sheep and the goats fellowship, the sheep and the goats worship, the sheep and the goats try to do ministry together. However, you can't pastor goats. You can pastor sheep, but you can't pastor goats. Goats you can only manage. Sheep you can pastor. However, the problem is, is we mingle together, and what we've got to make sure is we don't let the goat behavior of some rub off on us, causing us to become goats. And we've got to make sure that when we start to see, well, what's goat behavior, pastor? It is your flesh trying to take over your life. That's all it is. Because goats don't follow shepherds. Goats are independent. Goats want to do their own thing. Goats grow horns. Goats butt up against the shepherd, and they butt up against the sheep. They challenge the parameters of the the fold. That's what goats do. That's why it's hard to pastor goats. And that's why you've got to make sure that your flesh doesn't want to take hold of your life to where you become a goat. Let's look at this next scripture. 
Zechariah chapter 10, verse 3 says, My anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Now, before I get it into this too deep, let's just deal with this right up front, okay? All of us, I don't care how long you've been a Christian, I don't care how long you've been in church, in all of us, including me, including me as a pastor. I've known some pastors through the years that turned into a goat. So all of us are subject to turning into a goat. All of us could be a goat. There's a difference between goats and wolves. Wolves attack sheep. Wolves show their teeth. Wolves are out for blood. Now, sheep can turn into wolves, and sheep can turn into goats. Goats is the pathway to being a wolf. you got to catch yourself before you become a wolf. Are y'all here with me? Now, we can stand out as good sheep and turn into a goat later. Sheep are submissive. Sheep are humble. Sheep are spirit-led. Sheep are those that learn to crucify the flesh, and they don't let their independent flesh nature take a hold of them. But goats, they're fleshly. They're independent. They're domineering. They're carnal. And we'll, we'll explain all that a little bit later. But one of the things that we've got to learn in church, you know, this is, I want to get this out in the front. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have ever heard of the term perfect church? How many of you know there's no such thing as one? There's no perfect church. Um, it's, it's funny through the years because as a pastor, um, everybody wants a good church. Those of you that can remember the first time you walked in the doors of this church, you were coming hoping that the Lord would minister to you and you'd get fed and the Holy Spirit would move. And, and maybe when you visited here for the first time, you didn't know if this was the church you were going to call home. But, but as you came, eventually the Lord began to minister to you and you felt like this is my home and I can stay here. But a lot of people who are on that journey of looking for a church, they get this misconception of thinking that the church that they want to be a part of is the church that's perfect, where not just the pastor's perfect, but the congregation's perfect. And people that I, I call revival seekers, uh, glory seekers, these are people that are looking for a church that they actually think is going to be the perfect church. That they look around and they're like, oh my gosh, this church is so perfect. Everybody's perfect. Let me tell you, let me tell you, I'm, I'm going to tell you as a pastor, peeking behind the veil of ministry that knows a lot more than what the normal attender knows and understands what goes on behind the scenes in ministry, I'm telling you, there's no perfect church and I don't care how strong a church is. And I think we've got a strong church. I really do. I think we've got a very strong church. You're going to have goats in the congregation. You're going to have some wolves in the congregation. Now, the goal of a shepherd is point out the wolves and pray the wolves out. Are you with me? So, because wolves devour and wolves are out for blood, and Jesus talked about that. He said, beware of the wolves. They come in looking like sheep. Their goal is to destroy. The thing about a goat is, is they don't really want to destroy. They just don't like to follow the direction the church is going in. They just, they just buck heads. They don't want to listen to the shepherd. They're independent. They don't want to follow the direction of the Lord. They, and, and, and they're proud of it. So, so my goal, pray the wolves out, okay? But my goal for goats is pray that whoever it is, that is a goat. Now, some of you are like, can you tell us who the goats are? No, I'm not going to tell you who I, who, you know, so can you at least let us know who you think the goats are? <laughs> it's not my job. What my job is, and Jesus said this when he talked about the wheat and the tares. He said, understand the wheat and the tares are going to grow together. This is what Jesus said. He said, I'll deal with separating the wheat and tares. So my job is to pastor the sheep and the goats in hope that the Holy Spirit is moving enough in people's lives that they'll change that goat behavior, repent, submit to the Lord, and transition back into being a sheep <laughs> so that's my goal but people that want a perfect church this is what will happen they'll go to a fellowship or, or they'll be standing outside in the parking lot or you, you name it and they'll see the behavior of somebody who's a goat and they'll think that represents the rest of the church I, that's not the case i don't care where you go 
you're not going to find a perfect. You're going to, I don't care how perfect the church is. I, it might be on television. It might be running hundreds of thousands of people. I'm telling you, every church has goats. But we don't want people to turn into goats, and we want those that are goats to turn back into sheep. Am I making any sense in here? So we realize in every flock mixed with the sheep, there's going to be some goats. Except for the black goats and, and the eastern goats, it is impossible to tell the difference between a sheep and a goat in the first year of their life. After that first year, then it becomes distinctive, and you begin to see the little horns budding out of the head, and then the goats really begin to reveal themselves. And eventually, after time, the horns begin to twist and turn backwards. The male sheep's horns will core curl forward, excuse me. Now, in ancient culture, sheep and goats were raised together. When we realize that, that's key when we look at our own church, because there's going to be goats in with the sheep. Jesus said we just have to understand that that's part of being a, a part of a church. We just can't let that goat behavior rub off on us. Amen. You can love the goats. Amen. You can pray for the goats. Just don't become one. Hallelujah. Goats were generally dark in color and sheep generally white. Goats are able to cope with the mountains and the rocks, but the sheep, they prefer the flatter valleys. Goats eat the leaves off trees where sheep prefer grass. Goats graze all day while the sheep lie down in the shade during the heat of the day. Goats were less popular than sheep because goats are destructive. Grazing closer to the ground and destroying pastures. Goats also have a more stubborn, less pleasant disposition. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 22, I think I've got that in, a, in our PowerPoint. Um, it was the scapegoat that took the sins of the people. It wasn't the, the lamb, it was the goat. And the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities unto the land not inhabited, and he shall go, shall let the goat in the wilderness. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Lambs are good. Good Christians that are following the Lord are called sheep. Goats are always referred to as those that are independent, they're not blameless, they're stubborn, and it was the goat that took the sins of the people in the Old Testament. So there is a huge difference between sheep and goats. Both sheep and goats produce benefits to their owners, though. Sheep produce wool for clothing, milk for food, and they reproduced rapidly. Goats, goats also produced milk, about three quarts a day. Plus, they did give hair uh, but it was a different type of hair. It was a thicker hair, and so they used it for other things. Goat meat was not as tasty as lamb. Am I right with that, Bob? Goat meat is not as tasty as lamb? No, oh, no. <laughs> I stand corrected. For a shepherd who has raised both sheep and goats, separating them as they mature becomes very easy because you can clearly see a difference between the two. Not many of us have ever been shepherds. I am. But if you study this in Scripture, you realize that shepherds had a hard time trying to deal with the goats. Let's put this next Scripture up here. We're going to talk about this. Characteristics of a goat. Okay, This is going to be our guide. Characteristics of a goat. They have a beard and they have horns. We're going to talk about that. They have a distinctive odor. They're restless. Now, you got to spiritualize this, okay? And remember, goats are, are rebellious. Goats are carnal. Goats buck up against the following the shepherd. They don't want to flow with the vision of the church. Um, oh, is a pastor preaching against sin again? Oh, come on, do your own thing. So the, those are goats. And so you got to spiritualize this. They have beard and they have horns. They have a distinctive odor. They're restless. They like the, high, they like the hills, they challenge the perimeters of the flock. They challenge the shepherd. They do not follow well. They prefer to lead. They even want to lead the shepherd. So remember, like I said earlier, I've pastored a few goats through the years. Amen. They are not discriminating in their eating habits. And they, but now I don't know if we'll get through all of these tonight, but this is, this is our guide of where we're hoping to go in this lesson. Now, any shepherd will tell you goats differ from sheep. Goats have a beard. They have a strong odor. We'll call it a distinctive and penetrating personality. They mark the atmosphere with their presence. 
they're not unnoticed. That's something that I've noticed about people that display goatish behavior through the years. Now, not everybody that has a distinctive personality is a goat, so don't stereotype anybody. But I've noticed that most people that take on that behavior, ooh, they like to be seen and they like to be heard, and they like for their opinion to supersede what anybody else has to say about anything. Goats don't like to lie down in green pastures. They like to roam on their own. I'm not led by anybody. I'm a free thinker. I do my own thing. Psalm 104, 18. The high hills are a refuge for the wild goats. And the rocks, now in the King James it says conies, but that's badgers if you look that up. So the high hills are a refuge for the wild goats. What's that mean? They want to separate themselves from the rest of the flock. They don't want to have to graze in the fields with the sheep and the shepherd and do all the things that we're supposed to do. They, they, they want to do their own thing. Woo, look at this. Look at this. I don't have to go into the direction the Lord is leading the church. I'm going after the fire. I'm going after the revival. I'm doing my own thing, pastor. Here's the lesson. Goats are constantly challenging the perimeter of the fold. No matter what grazing ground the pastor selects, the goat is usually never satisfied. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 8. Do we have that in there? says, remove out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be as the he-goats before the flocks. Sheep will follow the shepherd. Sheep trust the shepherd. Sheep don't buck the shepherd. But goats are so sure that they know where the flock needs to be going that they are the ones that want to get out in front. They will not follow. They will not follow the shepherd. They will not follow the rest of the sheep. They want to be the ones out in front, seen and heard by everybody. Because goats like to lead. And not only other goats and other sheep, but goats want to lead the shepherd. I don't know. Is that a lack of submission? I don't know. Is that pride? I don't know. But it is a characteristic in the behavior of a goat. As we look at this a little bit deeper and we think about how this relates to us in the church atmosphere, some people in the church have a strong personality. When you look at the characteristics of a goat that says that they have a distinctive odor, an odor, you've got to spiritualize that. You've got to realize that because goats have an odor, some people with a strong personality emit a spiritual odor about themselves. They have a domineering personality and it permeates the flock. This is what happens. Hear me. Just like an odor, an, an odor permeates the atmosphere of where you're at, right? In the spirit, the odor of a goat permeates the, the spirit of the church. What do I mean by that? You get a goat in a church meeting. You get a goat in a small group. You get a goat in a fellowship. In the spirit, their odor is going to permeate the rest of the people. And they like it. Love to be seen. Love to be heard. Now, some of you are like, now, pastor, what about people that just have an outgoing? There is a huge difference. I want you to hear me. Between somebody who has a great outgoing personality. I mean, look around the sanctuary. We got some distinct personalities in this church. <laughs> and I have no problem with that. I love people that have an outgoing personality. I love people that that have a colorful personality. I love people that have a humorous personality. I, I, I love it. This is what I love about the Terror Church of God. We've got those kinds of personalities that are here. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? What I'm talking about are people who purposely love to make ripples in the atmosphere of the church because of that goatish behavior. They're the ones that love to make a statement that just goes against the flow. They're the ones that are always questioning, always dissecting, always criticizing. And it's like an odor that, that, that emits into the atmosphere of everywhere they go. Am I making any sense in here tonight? So they got a distinct odor. Say, I don't want to be a goat. <laughs> Come on, say it again. Say, I don't want to be a goat. <laughs> Amen. Okay. So that goat odor alters the atmosphere of the church. And if that goat is not dealt with, what will happen is that, hear me, 
that personality of the goat will spread to the rest of the sheep. And all of a sudden, the rest of the sheep take on the personality of that goat. That's where the shepherd's got to come in. That's when the shepherd's got to come in and say, hold on, hey, you need to take a shower spiritually. You need to do something about that odor. Matter of fact, you need to quit being a goat. How about being a sheep? Because what happens, and I've, and I've seen this through the years, what happens is the goat begins to influence other members of the church. You know, it's, it's funny through the years, it, it's, it's funny how people don't think that a pastor can see and discern what's going on in the flock. And through the years, I've pastored people, and people come in, they get on fire for the Lord, and man, they're serving the Lord, and the fruit of the Spirit is abounding, okay? So that's the difference between a goat and a sheep. A sheep is, is displaying the fruit of the Spirit. The goat, it's the fruit of self. That's the goat behavior. And then you see these people, all of a sudden, their attitude changes, their demeanor changes, their, their whole outlook on church and ministry and serving the Lord begins to change, and, and they kind of get an attitude. And then, then I'll sit back and I'll look at maybe who they're hanging around with, and I'm like, yep, that behavior is... How many of you, how many of you know what it's like when you got a child or a grandchild, and you're like, you're changing the, who they've been hanging around with, right? And, and New Testament talks about that. It talks about how the, the company that we keep will affect our behavior, okay? And so, see, as a pastor, I don't want those that are goats to affect the rest of the flock, especially good Good sheep that are doing ministry and serving the Lord and loving the Lord and reproducing other sheep and displaying the fruit of the Spirit. And so before I got to come in with my rod and my staff and deal with it, I pray and hope that the Holy Spirit will deal with it. Because I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to make anybody. Because I'm telling you, it doesn't go over very well if you look at somebody and say, you're a goat. Amen. Not a good pastoral strategy to look at somebody and say, hey, we need to talk. And you look at it, you're like, quit being a goat. You know, that's probably not a good strategy to shepherd. So, but because I'm a shepherd, okay, who carries a rod and a staff, what I try to do is get the individual to understand you're displaying goatish behavior. What, what I mean, you're displaying behavior that's not productive to you and it's not productive to the rest of the congregation. Let's pray about this, man. Let's give this to the Lord, and, and, and hopefully, you know, with, with a humble heart and the help of the Holy Spirit, and everybody's personalities and emotions are in check, and nobody gets offended, we can, we can salvage somebody who's a goat and get them back into the fold to be a sheep. Amen? That's my goal as a shepherd. Now, that hasn't always worked. I've tried that a few times, and I've, I've gotten um, <clears throat> my tail end butted with some horns a few times when I've tried. And it hurts as a pastor. It hurts. But my goal is for everybody to be who God called them to be. That's my goal. As a shepherd, that's my goal. I, I love everybody, and, 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 and I want everybody to conform to the image of Christ. I want everybody to, to display the fruit of the Spirit. I want everybody to transition from being a carnal Christian to a spiritual Christian. But there are just some people that even when you try to help them, even, even when you say, hey, can we pray about this? Hey, can we talk about this? Just, just for me and you, it don't, doesn't leave the room. Let's talk about this. Let's pray about this. Some people, they don't, they don't want to listen. They don't care. Who do you think you are? They get upset. They don't understand that I'm just doing my job. How many of you know that it's the job of the shepherd to do this? Come on. How many of you know this? How many of you know I'm not a good shepherd? If I see somebody displaying goatish behavior and, and just within the confines of the privacy of just my conversation with me and an individual, we're trying to get to the bottom of this. If, if you just confirm why I talk to you, if you do resist what I'm trying to share with you. You're confirming what I'm trying to share. Now, we might have a disagreement and we might not see eye to eye, but at least hear the heart of the shepherd. They're saying, listen, I'm doing this because I love you. I'm doing this because at one time I saw you displaying fruit. At one time I saw the love. At one time I said, but, but man, I, there's some things concerning me. You, you know, fruit doesn't lie. I'm, 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 seeing, I'm seeing some little horns popping out of your forehead here, and we need to deal with this. <laughs> Let's deal with this before they turn into full-blown horns, man. Can we do something about this? 
Am I making any sense in here tonight? Hey, listen, I'm trying to take a sensitive subject and teach it in love and grace tonight to get you to understand. Any situation that involves a goat, they want to be the ones calling the shots. They always want to be the one that is leading. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong. There are some people within our congregation who have a leadership anointing. But even me as a pastor, I have a leadership of anointing. I got to make sure that even as a pastor, I'm not a goat. And I'm not displaying goatish behavior. I got to make sure that I submit my leadership qualities to the lordship of Jesus. Because, see, you can be a leader and be gracious and loving and display the fruit of the Spirit and lead the way God wants us to lead. Or you can allow those leadership qualities to become goatish and you're not really leading. You're domineering, you don't want to listen, and you're constantly butting other people. Goats don't like to be submissive. Goats don't like to follow. Goats don't want to go with the flow of everything else that the Lord is doing within the congregation. If they're not the ones that are calling the shots, if they're not the ones that are ahead, they'll criticize the ones that are, and that goatish criticism will spread to the rest of the flock. And, and really, that's a telltale sign of goatish behavior, constantly criticizing now, I get it, man. If there's a legitimate beef, you come to me. We're going to talk about this. We're going to work this out. Hallelujah, hopefully. Sometimes criticisms are valid. Sometimes I do some stupid things. <laughs> come on. Sometimes I do some stupid things, make some stupid decisions, lead stupid. And I have. And I'll take it, man. You come to me and have a conversation. We're going to talk about this, and we're going to work this out. But see, goats, they don't want that. Goats want to just ram their horns in with somebody, and they're like, I don't care. This is the way it is, and I'm not going to follow the direction that the Lord has here. And they constantly criticize. Really, the goats, they know what's best. Also, goats are not discriminating in their eating habits. What you realize here is that goats will eat almost anything. How many of you know about that? How many of you have ever had goats, and you just set them loose in your yard, and you're like, let them have it? Amen. It's like, I need to get rid of all this stuff in this field. Set the goats loose, right? Matter of fact, when I was doing some research in, in history, there's goats have been known eating cans and batteries and, and even dynamite. I, if it looks good, they don't, they'll eat it, man. They don't, they don't care. And so I hope you're spiritualizing this. Amen. <laughs> Sounds like goats are bossy and stubborn. Amen. Praise the Lord. Unfortunately, there's always some unsuspecting sheep that will follow them. When that goat chooses to roam and to eat things they shouldn't be eating, what happens is, unfortunately, you get some good sheep that try to eat what the goat are eating, or trying to eat what the goat are, goats are eating. And what happens is they become spiritually ill as a result of eating it. Unlike the goat, the sheep is totally defenseless once out of the shepherd's care. The goats are always thinking independent of the flock and the shepherd. And because of their personality and because of their horns, they exist on their own, their own planet, their own little world. Also, goats are restless. In the fold, they can create dissension. They stir up strife. They can rub their personality off on somebody else who's at peace with who they are in Christ, at peace with the vision of the church, at peace in their relationship with the Lord, at peace where the church is headed. And you give somebody restless influence in that person, and now all of a sudden, they're starting to be restless. They're starting to criticize. They're starting to see, that. well, you know, I never really thought about that. You know, I never really noticed that. You know, that's something about the pastor I never really thought, but boy, I'm starting to see that now. Are you here? Anybody here? Amen. Amen. Goats love to make waves. Goats aren't timid. And goats always challenge the shepherd. Let's talk about this restlessness for a second. Restlessness can be a good thing if that restlessness causes us to want to get closer to the Lord. You hear me. You know enough of, of my heart. I'm always telling you to go to the next level. There's a restlessness in your spirit. I want to get to another level. I want to grow. I want to get to another level of, re of revelation. That's not what I'm talking about. 
if, if it's a restlessness for your walk with the Lord, if it's a restlessness because you're not satisfied with your present level and you're wanting to get to a new level, that's good restlessness. That's going from one level to the next. I've preached on that. You hear me preach on it a lot. I teach on that a lot. I encourage you. That's not what I'm talking I'm talking about a restlessness that nothing is ever done right. Nothing is ever good enough. It is always criticism. There's always a restlessness. And, and this is what's funny. Usually it's the goats that aren't doing the church work, but they'll sure criticize those that are. This is what I say. Get busy and find something to do then. If you get busy and find something to do, you won't be restless and you won't be critical because you're too busy trying to do what God called you to do in the, in, the, in the flock and getting busy about the Father's business. You don't have enough time to be critical. Hallelujah. That's some good preaching, Pastor. People that are restless are always causing strife and even influencing sheep that are content, sheep that are grazing together, sheep that are walking in peace and one mind together. Well, all of a sudden, they cause them to become restless. Are you starting to see this now, how that goatish behavior can crop up in us without realizing it? And without realizing it, realizing it, we might be influencing others to display that goatish behavior? Proverbs chapter 6. Okay, before I jump into this, I'm going to take a water break, and I'm going to open it up for discussion. Yes. The scapegoat, what would happen is the priest would, it's symbolic, would take the sins of the people and place it on the goat. And because the goat was wild and the goat was independent, once they placed the sins on the scapegoat and kind of smacked, the goat would take off out in the wild. No, because, because the goats could, could be uh, blemished. The lambs whose blood was shed on behalf of the sins of the people, they were, they were without spot or, or, or they were unblemished. No, that not, if they, not if, they were un, if they were blemished, they could not. The goat was used for the scapegoat if that makes sense, because goats were independent and they knew that once they let the goat go, he would take off. That's why the goat was used as the scapegoat. The, well, the goats were blemished, period, yeah. Yeah, it, but it was all symbolic, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's put it to you this way. The, the, sins, the sins weren't put on sheep, only goats. Because the sheep would still be standing around because they got sheep behavior. They're like, whoa, i got to be part of a fold here. But the goats, because they were independent, they'd take off. Does that, does that make sense? So it was all symbolic. Carrying the sins away. Yeah. Anybody? Anybody else? This is some good stuff. Listen, let me say this. When we all get saved, we're all goats. Can we just say that for people to understand what I'm talking about here? And so what happens is, and, and the reason why we're all goats is because we were independent doing our own thing, serving ourselves. And now we've given a heart to Jesus. And we're like, okay, I'm no longer a goat. I'm going to be a sheep now. I am part of God's fold. I submit my life to the shepherd who's Jesus. Now, obviously, a lot of the things that we're talking about is dealing with a local congregation. Um, and so we, we learn from that relationship between a sheep and shepherds. But we were all goats when we were sinners. <laughs> And so if we start to display that goatish behavior, basically it's, we're just becoming independent again, carnal, doing our own thing. And, and that's the distinction that, that we're trying to, to bring here. Um, how many of you know what it's like when you give your heart to the Lord? I remember when I first got saved, those first few weeks I was in, I mean, there's such a, a joy that hits you if you come out of the life like I come out of. But... How many of you know you can't live there all the time? It, it, reality sets in. And, and, you know, it's funny. When, when I first got saved, it seemed like I was, you know, in the glory. And, and my prayers were answered quickly. And it just seemed like I was in the clouds. And then all of a sudden, as I began to disciple myself and grow in the Lord, 
things began to change and then my flesh was starting to take back over and my personality was wanting to take back over in those oh because what happens jesus says when a strong man leaves he goes into the wilderness finds seven more more powerful and eventually after time that strong man comes back because the strong man doesn't like the fact that you're no longer a goat now you're a part of the fold and that strong man comes back now i heard somebody say one time we always say it seven times. No, it's really eight because you got the original strong man and the seven extra. So that, that stronghold comes back because it doesn't like the fact you're submitting your heart to the Lord because the enemy knows how damaging our carnal nature is. The, the moment we let our flesh take over, our flesh is independent. We look out for number one. Can I get a witness here? You, you know, I, I wrote this the other day on, on, on Facebook. The, the top three false gods are me, myself, and I. Top three false gods, me, myself, and I. Because we make ourselves out to be a, fa a false god, an idol. You, me, 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 and what I want and what I want to do. This is my opinion. This is my way. No, Jesus said when you get saved, you got to crucify that. you got to die daily, take up the cross. And so the only way that we can get away from that goatish behavior is living a submissive life, crucifying the flesh, and saying, no, God, I'm not going to live like this. I'm going to serve you and submit to you. Amen? Anybody else real quick before we jump into Proverbs 6? Uh, let me say this. Are you, are you keeping up with me? I don't want to... Are you, are you understanding what I'm talking about tonight? Don't leave here and say, pastor's called us a bunch of goats. <laughs> he said, we stink and have odor. Said the women have beards. <laughs> so don't, don't. Hey, let, you wouldn't believe the things through the years if I preached on something that gets back to me. And they're like, did you say this? I'm like, not in the context of how you're saying it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> so, okay, let's, let's look into this. Okay. Talk about restlessness. Proverbs chapter 6, says we're, ta we're talking about strife. Verse 16. This is goatish behavior right here. These six things the Lord hates, a seven are an abomination unto him. Verse 17. A proud look, pride, a lying tongue. I'm telling you, I've been a pastor long enough. Usually at the heart of, of most independent attitudes is pride. Because pride puts us above God. It puts us on the throne of life. That's pride. So a proud look, a lying tongue. This is a good one. Hands that shed innocent blood. You remember we talked about goats and we talked about wolves. And those are the, the behaviors that, that I have to as a shepherd oversee at a church my goal is that the goat doesn't become a wolf but the goat turns back to being a sheep amen that i can restore that carnal behavior but once it starts turning into innocent blood being shed then we we got an issue um there's one thing about me uh, as a shepherd i love everybody anybody that knows me anybody that's been in this ministry long enough um, that has seen me have to deal with things understand that there are, are different characteristics of who I am as a shepherd that is displayed based on what I have to deal with. And I deal lovingly with goats, but I'll tell you what, I, I deal lovingly but sternly with wolves. I'm going to tell you why. The moment I see a wolf shedding blood of another member of the church, you're going to see this shepherd get involved. And I don't, I, 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 I pull back none in saying that. I've had to tell some wolves through the years, might be best if you found another fold to fellowship with. And some people might say, man, that's awfully harsh of you. I'm going to tell you, that is a last resort. You've got to understand that. I don't like it. But if I realize that that, that wolf behavior will not go back to being a sheep to protect the rest of the flock. And the reason why I can say that is because I've learned from experience 
because I was too scared to offend somebody or I was too scared to make somebody mad or maybe as a shepherd I was just too young and just not experienced enough. I hadn't seen enough in church to know any better where I didn't do anything and as a result, innocent blood was shed. What do I mean by that? Innocent families got caught up in situations and they ended up either turning their back on the Lord or just leaving the church and a big chunk of the church leaves. And I've learned from experience, I will never let that happen again. The moment I see a drop of blood being shed in my congregation, I want to know who has the fangs and who has the claws. And I want to know where the wolves are because when I find out where that wolf is, now I understand I don't wrestle with flesh and blood, so I'm going to deal with it in the realm of the spirit before I deal with it in the natural. I'm going to pray. I'm going to rebuke. I'm going to bind. I'm going to come against it and hope that that will, but you know what? And more times than none, not only do I have to pray, I got to put action to those prayers and I still got to intervene. Why? Because I'm a shepherd. And I have a whole congregation that i got to look after. And I have to deal with the overall health of the church, and i got to make sure that innocent blood's not being shed. See a different side of this pastor when I see a wolf. How many, how many of you mamas know about that? Come on, who in here? Come on. You're a mama, you love your babies. Man, you get somebody that's going to harm that baby, they're a different side of you comes out. Amen. And you can smile in Jesus' name, but be like, you get a wave because you're going to regret this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's keep going. Verse 18. A heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift and running to mischief. That's a goat. Running to mischief. Verse 19. False witness that speaks lies and he that sows discord among the brethren. Now, I want you to take note that in verse 16, the Lord says that not only does he hate these things, that they are an abomination to him. So let's go back. Let's go back to th this list as we wind this thing down. Let's go back to the, um, I think I've got my point there that describes what we just talked about. Is that in there? Yeah, okay. So here we go. Here's a review. Characteristics of a goat. They have a beard and they have horns. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that is, is that um, the beard represents looking different. It's distinctive from the sheep. The horns represent um, budding behavior. Um, I, I remember when, it's been a few years ago, I remember when I went to a petting zoo with Josh when he was younger. I mean, we're, I mean, Josh is going to be 31, so this has been a while back. I think it was at the Indianapolis Zoo, and they got a little petting zoo in there. And I remember when he went in there, and of course, how many of you have ever been to a petting zoo? You take your kids and your grandkids. And there was a little goat in there, a lot of them. And this goat was like not a good goat. <laughs> and little, little toddler Josh, I think Josh was like three or four years old, and that goat just kept nudging him and coming up against him. And that's when dad had to intervene and get that goat away. And you see that happen. Well, it's because of those horns. Well, it was a baby goat, and that's what they do in a petting zoo. They got the little baby goat. You get those full-grown goats? That's a characteristic. They have a distinctive odor. We talked about that. They're restless. Yes. Oh. But, oh, man, that's some good preaching, Aaron. <laughs> but see, this is what I'm trying to get us to understand. That behavior is natural to the goat. They don't know anything better. So when people are displaying that behavior, that's natural. And so sometimes when you try to point that out, they're, they're like, whoa, whoa, hold on. What, what? That's, just, that's just who I am. You're like, yeah, I understand that's who you are, but what you need to do, submit that. See, it, See, a lot, of, a lot of times leaders don't understand that they have to submit that leadership quality. It can be good and it can be bad. People that are leaders, people that want to stand up front, that can be good and that can be bad. It's, it's great when it's submitted to God. But if it's given to the flesh, it can be a bad thing because it brings division in the body. Does, does that make sense, everybody? So, D'Angelo, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, think about for people that are constantly going, but, but, but. Yeah, that's the horns. They're budding. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. They like the high places, the hills. Why? They want to stay away from the rest. You know, I, I, I don't say this in a bad way. This is why you see me promote in the church fellowship and unity. Um, it's, it's dangerous when people just want to stay distant from the rest of the flock. I'm just, me and just got my own thing going on, you know. And I'm like, oh, I, I get that to a certain degree, but man, to a certain degree, we ought to be together as a flock. You know, there's strength when we fellowship, there's strength when we pray together, there's strength when we do things together. And, and, and I, even this next year, I'd love, to, this next year, I'd love to have a foot washing. How many of you have ever been a part of some good old fashioned foot washing services? Amen. And, I kind of feel like we need to do that this, this next year. It's humbling, isn't it? You know, it's, it's very humbling. So the Emmaus community probably does foot washing. Am I right on this? Yeah, it's very humbling. See, goats, ah, no, that's just, that's just not for me. Listen, to all of, listen, all of these spiritual disciplines that the Lord puts in the congregation, forgiving everybody and praying with one another, and walking, what that does is it crucifies goat behavior. That's all that does, is it keeps us from being like that. But review, they challenge the perimeters of the flock. They challenge the shepherd. They don't follow well. They prefer to lead even the shepherd. They are not discriminating in their eating habits, and then they butt. So that's kind of a review of how we look at the life of a goat. Now, not next week because we don't have Wednesday, but let's put this next. This is what we're going to talk about um, two weeks from now. We're going to talk about how to discern that goatee behavior. Well, pastor, what can I do? And so we're going to make it more personal to where you can discern your own life to make sure that your goatee behavior doesn't get bad and you transition from being a sheep to a goat. Because all of us can do that. All of us can. And we got to make sure it doesn't happen. All right? So that's what we'll talk about in a couple weeks. Okay, anybody else as we close? This is some good stuff, isn't it? How many's ever heard of teaching on this before? How many hasn't heard it? How many you've never heard a teaching on this before? Were your eyes open a little bit tonight? Did you learn? Did, how many of you learned something tonight? Okay. Some of the best leaders in a church, and I mean this, and, and I really do mean this, some of the best leaders are people who have displayed that goatee behavior, and sometimes what it is is just a leadership quality. They just haven't submitted it to the Lord. It, it's a certain trait that God placed in them, but because they let their flesh dominate the gift instead of the Holy Spirit, instead of being a fruitful leadership quality, what it becomes is a destructive quality to the church. Does that make sense? And I've seen that a lot. And, and through the years, I've seen some that have been like that, that, man, God just gets a hold of them, and they become some of the best leaders you've seen in the church. I mean, some of the best leaders. And, um, and that's, that's my goal as a shepherd, is, is to, to flesh that out in the congregation. Yeah, a lot of your um, Satanist drawings and idols and all that stuff, you see the goat man. And, uh, well, it's because of what Scripture talks about concerning a goat. Yeah. Yeah, S S Satan is the, and, and we're not talking, about, now, let me say this. There's a term that people use nowadays referring to an athlete, and they're like, they're the goat greatest of all time so kind of like you know michael jordan's the goat I don't, i'm not going to debate you on that he's the goat <laughs> or you know what they're referring to is the greatest of all you know it's an acronym so when you hear people say that you know so and so is the goat that's that's not what they're talking about they're talking about another something totally different so okay anybody else good stuff good discussion tonight good points anybody else all right, stand with me. Um, I'm just going to throw this out here. Are you glad that I'm a pastor that will address this? Yes. Amen. And are you glad that I'm a pastor that will look after this flock and make sure that wolves don't come in and destroy? Yes. Amen. Amen. Because I love you too much to let that happen. Um, now, through the years, there's been some times that I've 
uh, not handled things the right way. And, um, but I hope those experiences have helped make me a better pastor. Sometimes I've come in and thought somebody was a wolf and they weren't. They were just displaying goatish behavior. You deal with a goat different than a, than a wolf. And so that's what I'm trying to do. But really what I'm trying to do is for you to, to make it personal in your own walk with the Lord, that you evaluate your own walk and say, Jesus, whew, Jesus, I don't ever want to be a goat, ever. I don't want to display that kind of behavior. Because when you look at Matthew chapter 25 and Jesus says he separates, if you keep reading that, what Jesus says is when he talks to the sheep, Jesus says, you displayed the fruit of a true believer. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When you did, the, you did these things in my name, you didn't just say this is who you were. You showed the fruit of this in your life. And that was the distinction between the sheep and the goats. Amen. Let's close. Father, I thank you for truth, and I thank you that the truth makes us free. And Lord, I thank you that on this journey of our faith, we are being transformed from glory to glory. And in that transformation, the Holy Spirit is giving us the ability to crucify our flesh and to die daily. And Father, I pray that everybody that's in this class that has heard this lesson tonight is going to retain this word and they're going to apply it to their life. And I, I come against confusion. I rebuke confusion. Lord, I pray that nobody's going to be confused about what was said or what we're trying to accomplish. But they're going to gain the truth of your word and apply it to their lives so we all, we all can be the type of believer that you've called us to be. Lord, I pray that you be with us as we go home. I pray for safety these next couple of ways with this, or these next couple of days with this weather pattern coming in. Lord, I'm just believing that everybody's going to be safe. And Lord, for those that are able to make it Sunday, I pray that this Christmas service is going to be a wonderful time of magnifying you, worshiping you, and just a wonderful day of ministry. Lord, if, if, if somebody walks in this church Sunday that doesn't know you, that has chosen to come on a Christmas service, if it's just one person, Lord, get a hold of their heart. And I pray that you take this Christmas message and penetrate their heart and let them give their heart to you before the end of the service. That's my prayer. And so, Lord, we just pray, be with us, bring us back safely Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.